forests, fjords, mountains, an endless coastline, and a vibrant indigenous culture. New Zealand is a beautiful and pristine place, and its people want to keep it that way. This is a small country with a big dream to become the world's first sustainable nation. I'm Art Wolf. This is Travels to the Edge. In the Southwest Pacific, 1,200 miles east of Australia, lies the isolated nation of New Zealand. Surrounded by the Pacific Ocean and the Tasman Sea, New Zealand is comprised of two large islands and numerous small ones. To its indigenous people, the Maori is known as Aotearoa, land of the long white cloud. New Zealand's striking beauty is central to its identity. Here, Maori people consider themselves guardians of the land sea, plants, and animals. I'm having a lot of fun here. It takes a while to kind of get in sync with the subject. Here on the human body, there's so much detail and beauty. I'm really playing to that. Originally, Maori tattooing known as tamoko was chiseled into the skin using an albatross bone. The practice is sacred, a way of inscribing an individual's history on his face. For us, moko goes back to the beginning of time, really. We have a history and a set body of knowledge that talks about the origins of moko. It symbolizes my lineage through my mother's genealogy to myself and through my father's genealogy. And this here depicts the breath of life passing through into the nostrils from where mankind received the breath of life from the creator, Io. We tie it back to the gods, the god that in particular that was the guardian of this art form is also the god of earthquakes. So what it's saying for me is, the history of Moko and the tradition of Moko especially goes back to the land. When you look at the land from on high and you can see valleys and crevices, it's the same God that creates earthquakes and moves the place around that gives what we call Papa Tūnuku, Mother Earth, her Moko. A lot of the spirals are taken from the tree fern, what we call the, the, the koru pattern. It has to do with regeneration of life or the beginning of life. All the symbols are very positive symbols. We don't have negative symbols in our artwork. All our patterns are taken from nature. If not nature, the ideas of movement, concepts of um, duality, male and female elements. Most of our patterns are, are rooted inside an esoteric body of knowledge. On my lower lip here, there's a, a double koru pattern. And it symbolizes the mango pare, which is the Māori name for the hammerhead shark. It's used in Moko as a sign of tenacity or, and it's to enhance your abilities to, to protect and to defend. I'm really proud to wear a mark of my ancestors. The reverence the Maori feel for the land and the sea is now being shared by its European, or Pākehā, culture. Here, no point of land is farther than 80 miles from the water. The ocean and this wild, pristine coastline is at the heart of New Zealand's identity. Tasman Sea meets the land. This is where also 
hundreds and hundreds of Australasian gannets come to nest. These are beautiful, graceful birds of the sea. They only come ashore once a year, and that's during the breeding season. Some of the adults are actually courting each other. These birds fly with effortless grace and beauty. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen, all for free. No subscription required. When the birds come in and they nearly land on their rookery, they take off and then I can isolate these birds against this beautiful backdrop of the water. It's a very clean but elegant shot. As graceful as they are over the water, when they're on the land, they're very clumsy birds. So they kind of walk around like chickens getting to their nest. Some crash literally onto their nest. And when they take off and they unfurl their six foot wings, then suddenly this ugly duckling turns into a graceful albatross. As in most roadless areas, the best way to get into the backcountry is by chopper. And the views en route to Franz Josef Glacier are stunning. I've done a lot of flights over mountains, but these are so precipitous. They're so new and razor sharp, it takes my breath away. When you look down atop a glacier and you see the rhythm of these fractures, it's actually like waves coming into an ocean. They're so uniform. Joining me is Peter Hayden, one of New Zealand's most respected naturalist and documentary filmmakers. We have over 100 glaciers here in New Zealand, and this is one of two that flow down on the west side and down into the forest. The dynamics of this glacier starts with the flow. Up high, it's just a very benign snowfield, but as it starts to gain volume, it starts to slide downhill. And when it comes over a very steep hillside, it's known as an ice fall. It's broken up. It's full of what they call seracs. We'll be getting some ice caves around here, and they will be spectacular. The Himalayan tar, an introduced species, is a wild goat that has adapted to life down under. Pretty spectacular to see these two animals adroitly picking their way through this jumble of ice and seracs, which is a very dangerous environment, but they just seem to negotiate all the oblique angles and the steep ice without a problem. Wow. This is a beautiful ice cave. Let's explore. This is beautiful. The texture inside this ice cave is such a difference from the outside, which is very hard angles. Here, within this glacier, it's been worn down by the wind and the rain, and it's very, very soft and elegant. very translucent, and that's what I'm really trying to get with these shots. A sense of the ice, the way the light refracts through it, and this huge translucent ice cube that I'm walking through.
This is pretty amazing country to be flying over. There's a peacefulness up here as the clouds cloak these young mountains. Milford Sound is the gateway to Fjordland, one of the most beautiful and wild regions in the Southern Hemisphere. These dramatic fjords were carved by massive glaciers and then flooded by a rising sea. From up here, it's remarkable to see so many waterfalls dropping over the rugged cliffs into the sea below. Pretty spectacular environment here, Peter. Yeah, Milford Sound, Piu Piu Tahi, known to the Maldives. This is unbelievable. These are very high mountains that are just plunging into the yeah, salt water. The scale is amazing. It's almost 5,000 feet. Some of them are over 5,000 feet. And then below the surface, another 1,000 feet. So they're 6,000 feet straight up, almost vertical. It's sensational. Well, it's going to rain. God's going to send the water from Zion. He's going to raise his heaven up high. It's going to rain, but it's going to rain. Well, it's going to rain, children. God's going to send the water from ground. He's going to raise his heaven up high. It's going to rain, but it's going to rain. The Maoris have a good name for this country. It's called Aotearoa, the land of the long white cloud. And clouds mean rain, and that's what we're getting today. We're under the long white cloud. Southwest New Zealand is the greatest wilderness in the Southern Hemisphere, without a doubt. One tenth of New Zealand is wrapped up in this huge world heritage site. One third of the whole country has been protected. That's a, the highest percentage in the world. Peter, where does the spirit of conservation originate? It begins with the Māori people. and They have a, a really nice concept. It's called kaitiakitanga. And that means, I, I can't fully explain it, but the closest I can get is guardianship. It means that we're part of nature, and because we have an intelligence, we have a spirit, we have a responsibility to look after not just the green things, but all the animals and all the insects that live in it, and not just for our children, but it's kind of for all time. And it's not because we stand above it, it's because we are part of it. I want to show you what I saw on this last trip. It's a spectacular entrance to Milford Sound. I mean, as you come in and around the bend and suddenly there's that waterfall just hanging on that wall. Look at that. Oh, wow. Just a tiny piece of the Ice Age there, I think. Oh, that's a good one. Ah, oh, this is great. Right now, a heron has just landed at its nest and its two babies are begging for food, and it's very, very dynamic with their brilliant white plumage. As they're landing, for a couple seconds, their wings are flapping up and down, and every feather in their wing is really clearly delineated. And it's so graphic and very, very artistic. Amongst these beautiful white herons, is the strange and striking royal spoonbill, aptly named because of the way their beak is shaped. These birds are really animated. And I've got one down here grabbing vegetation right on the river's edge. Now, did I understand it that the Maori have a connection with these birds? Yes, amazing connection. To call someone the kutuku, which is the name of the, the heron, the Māori name, is like a special friend that you haven't seen for a long time. And the other thing that the Māori revere them for is because they've seen them spreading north after the breeding season, and they have taken that as the harbinger of death, and they will actually accompany the spirit of the dead person. It's the long flight, taking the spirit of the dead to the very north of New Zealand. Then they go across the sea to the ancient homeland of Hawaii. To the east of 
the Southern Alps, the air gets drier, the skies get wider, and the views get bigger. This is classic New Zealand sheep country. This is such a symbolic scene in New Zealand. There's way more sheep than there are people. And so set out here in these open grassy slopes with the backdrop of the Alps in one image, it says New Zealand. There are approximately 34 million sheep in New Zealand, far outnumbering the four million Kiwis who also live here. This shepherd tends his flock of merino sheep, which produces the finest wool in the world. What's the objective of moving the sheep around? Well, the, the idea is they're up here for, for three or four months. They're eating all this, this rough grass. Grass is getting down in quality, so we move them onto another block with better quality grass. And we'll keep on doing that until we take them home and take them lambs off the mothers. Without the dogs on this high country up here, you'd have to have 20 or 30 men. So the more dogs you have, the less men you need to move the stock. This is a stunning location to be photographing these sheep and the sheep dogs moving the flock right down in front of this wild landscape. Ah, oh, this is nice. Not only sheep, but the kia, an alpine parrot, thrives in this high country. They have beautiful plumage, with each feather clearly outlined with a dark band. The beak is so strong, it can easily take off a finger. They're curious, they're inquisitive, they often hang out around people because they want to play with rubber, they want to investigate anything shiny. It's just an extraordinarily beautiful bird. You want to be part of a picture? We're doing a story on New Zealand, and you guys would be such perfect subjects. Very cool. Hey, you. <laughs> That's a close up. always up to no good. This is exactly what I was hoping to get. This is a classic New Zealand beach forest. These trees are twisted by the winds and then cloaked with moss and lichens. It creates a really fanciful landscape in this beautiful forest. looking at the highest peak in all of New Zealand, Mount Cook. It's so beautiful and the winds are so calm that there's a perfect reflection. One of the things you notice as you travel throughout New Zealand is how pristine it is. I'm really trying to capture the essence of the place. The rhythm of the river really is intoxicating and in many ways it frees up my mind to really respond just on a elemental artistic level.
The texture of these high altitude forests are amazing. The rocks, the trees, the ground are virtually covered in a carpet of lichens and mosses. One of my favorite shots right here is of two trees overlapping each other with a rock in the background. The rock is covered in mosses and soft light. The trunks of the trees in the foreground are almost camouflaged by the layering of huge fungus and mosses and lichens. And so it becomes a very abstract world. New Zealand's desire to be a sustainable nation is not new. It's the essence of the Maori view of life, which sees humans as deeply connected to the natural world. Blaine Terito, a renowned Maori artist, explains. The Maori have a great concept of caring for the land. The concept comes because uh, when the world was created, when the sky, our sky father was separated from the earth mother, their children undertook creating certain elements of the natural world. We're one of them. So we see a tree and a rock and an insect as, as part of our family. We, we all come from the same ancestry. The kaitiakitanga is to take care of not only your mortal family, your physical human family, but also the family in the waters, the family in the, in the forest and in the trees. So if you wanted to use a tree for, for carving, there's, it would be like taking one of your, taking the life of a cousin. And so there's a ritual and there's a there's karaki or, or there's a protocol that you go through to ask permission to remove the to remove the tree to take the, the tree's life. When I'm required to create a new art piece, I know they need to be near the sea or in the forest or in the bush like this. Pay just to sit and not think of anything. If you just open your mind and, and things will happen. I don't know, maybe it's the, the spirit coming through and urging you to think that way. People of New Zealand clearly have a deep connection with their environment. They know they live in a beautiful part of the world, and their efforts to preserve these islands just may offer a pathway for us all to follow. I'm Art Wolf. Join me next time on Travels to the Edge. This is the Asia that most of us envision. Chaotic, bustling, and urban. But beyond the crowded cities of Nepal and India lie precious remnants of wild Asia, where rhinos, tigers, and bears still roam free. I'm Art Wolf. This is Travels to the Edge. From here in Kathmandu, the great Himalayas rise north into the clouds. But on this trip, we're skipping the big mountains and heading into the lowlands. First to Nepal's Chitwan National Park, and then into India in search of Asia's most impressive wildlife. As dawn breaks over the Rapti River, I'm making my way towards Royal Chitwan National Park. It's a peaceful scene as these local Taru people make their way towards the Sal forest to gather firewood. Namaste. 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 Chitwan is one of the few remaining wild areas that once extended in a wide swath along the foothills of India and Nepal. 
Its rivers and forests are rich with wildlife, including birds, rhino, and reptiles. This is the animal I was hoping to see in the wild. This is known as a gharial. It's relatively harmless to humans because of the narrowness of the snout. Just a very unique animal. I've never seen it before. I've seen a lot of caiman and crocodiles and alligators, but never. Oh, and it's coming right towards me. That was exciting. Crocodile, let's go closer. This has got the potential for a very nice image. Let's see what I can do with this. I never can get enough shots of these reptiles. They're so primordial, they're so ancient. They're so unlike any other animal. It wasn't glamorous, but see? Oh no, Easy. You, you did it so <laughs> smoothly. I've recruited Dan Bahadur Tamang, a local naturalist, to guide me through the park. Going by elephant gives us greater access, allowing us to explore the forest without disturbing other wildlife. We're moving through Chitwan National Park, looking for the world's largest rhino, the one-horned Indian rhino. We're going to follow the tracks. You can see actually here, look. Oh yeah. You see that? Yeah. They have three toes. Hunting for a rhino. Who would have thought? This is cool. And it could be just out here in the grass. Or not. It could be. Could be it here. Could be. Yes. That's the rhinos there. Let's go, 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 go. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. How many rhinos are in the park? We have about uh, 375 rhinos in the whole park, yes. But this is really good habitat for the rhinos. I remember coming here 20 years ago and there weren't that many rhinos. That time is very uh, low numbers, like about, about 80 or something left. So it's getting better now. Rhino horns actually made by the hair. The horn is really dense, hard hair? Very hard hair, yes. It's no bone at all. You see the armor plate there? Look like it's very strong now, but uh, now it's very soft. When the skin is dry, it's like a bulletproof. These are really fast animals. They are, you know, like uh, they run like 40 kilometers per hour if they wanted, but they're not far 40. distant, but wow. short distance, that fast they run. You have to be very careful when you're on walking. Oh. Keep going, keep going, keep going. This is really nice. Mother with his calf, the calf is running around. So let's just go a little further up here. Not too close. Oh, stop, stop, stop. That was the shot I was hoping to get. Perfect light. Just the last few moments of the day when the light is sufficient enough to stop the motion. Really nice. They're about to go off into some really tall grass right now. And I think that's it for the day. are taking these elephants in for a bath. The elephants have been working in the forest in Chitwan all morning long, and now they love nothing more than to get into the water. Oh, look at that. Oh, nice moment. Oh, it feels so good.
Clearly the Mahout and the elephant have created a very strong bond of trust. And now look at this Mahout. He's cleaning the stones out of the elephant's feet and he's just gently letting the water crest his body. It's just really a nice tender moment. Just amazing control and trust between man and elephant here. They look like big teddy bears. Nice, powerful animals. I just love this view when the elephant gives this guy a bath. Dan believes there's sloth bear in this particular forest. Sloth bears are really ferocious and very secretive animals. A sloth bear with two babies on the back and one on the ground. These bears are very unique in the bear world in their ability to carry their babies on their back. Let's go up the road. I can't believe the babies are still on her. Let me see if I got that. Yeah, look at that picture. I've got it. You can see the two babies, oh, but no head on the mother. Right. So clear. Oh. Almost a good shot. Almost a good shot. Sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't. Yeah. Tomorrow we'll try again. That's it. All right, let's go home. Okay. This is really nice. Mother and its two month old calf right out in warm early morning light. I love it when the baby just runs through the mother's legs for security. So it goes out 10, 15, 20 feet away from the mother and then comes right back. And every time it comes back, there's some sort of connection with the mother. The baby's putting its nose up. It's got its eyes looking at us. It tweaks its ears. And it's almost got this goofy expression, which is really nice to capture on such an enormous animal. See the baby is it's looking at us and it go to the mother to touching again and coming <laughs> back, you know? It's just fascinating to me how adorable a baby rhino can be. These are animals that have been hammered in the past by poaching and by trophy hunting and it's great to see so many of them giving birth to babies and relaxed and in their natural habitat, which is exactly the way one would hope to see them.
It's so amazing that it was here. Be okay if I get out? Yeah, we're not going too far. We go over here. Okay. What's the rhino? If if rhino come toward us, yeah, we leave your camera there, whatever yep. you have, yep. and we just run out the car. Okay. Okay. These animals are short tempered and fast moving. Now we're getting to the point where we are exposed. I've been charged before and we don't want that. So let's just bring the car down. That's a big bull. Big bull, yes, big male. Big dominant male of this area. And he's got a big scar on his shoulder. Yeah, he'd been fighting with other male. So how fast can you run? Not very fast, sir. Not very fast. No, no, I can run up to the tree. But let's go down the road and see what we can okay. find. OK, OK, sir, go this way. OK. Yeah, leave Ryan in the grassland. See if we can get a little closer by the car. Right? Oh, yeah. OK. Right here, right there. This is really close. This is the best view I've seen, especially of a male. And he is checking us out right now. It's really amazing when it lifts its head and suddenly stares right at you. It goes instantly from an animal grazing in the grass to being this powerful presence. We've left the sal forests of Nepal and traveled further south to the green heart of India and the jungles of Bandavgar. Not only is Bandavgar rich with wildlife, it's a sanctuary for Asia's last remaining Bengal tigers. Finding a tiger in a jungle is like a needle in a haystack. <laughs> Just moving through the trees. Oh, there, there's two tigers right here. Tigers, wild Bengal tigers in India. Wow, fantastic. Right there. There's a tiger just laying down. I've got a partial view. It's really difficult to get a good view. This beautiful Bengal female is sitting behind some very fine lined bamboo. And so I'm gonna shoot this animal within the context of its environment. The bamboo is every bit as important as the cat itself. Look at us. Oh, gee. So beautiful on this log. I love the natural relaxed behavior. When a tiger looks into your eyes, you never forget the moment. Wow, what a powerful cat. Just beautiful. This tiger keeps wanting to charge the elephant. Mm. 
Just to see the power and the, the stealth of these animals is amazing. Everywhere this cat goes, he looks great. Look at the eye spots behind the ears. And they're meant to really keep them from being attacked from behind by other animals like other tigers. And it just looks like he's staring right back at us. second most populated country in the world and it's just amazing and it's a comfort to me to know that there are natural environments where the tiger still thrives. For my last excursion into the forest, I've been lucky enough to be joined by Belinda Wright, the world's foremost authority on Bengal tigers and a passionate advocate for their preservation. This is prime tiger habitat. They also live in mangroves, they live in grasslands. And they're very adaptable. In this particular area, this, it says very high density of tigers. There's probably eight or nine tigresses with cubs. Wow. Probably the easiest way to find the tiger is to listen to be sort of quiet and listen to alarm calls. Because a, a, a predator like that just cannot wander around a jungle like this without somebody giving it away. No, I'm listening. will stay with the mother for a couple of years. Yeah. I mean, and she's teaching them how to hunt. She teaches them everything. How often does she have to take an animal? These cubs are large, so she would be, you know, every three days, four days, she'll, she'll have to kill to provide for them. She's a busy lady. Tigers occur in small numbers all over the place, but it's only India that has a population of over 500 wild tigers. It's fairly miraculous that, that India still has tigers at all. I mean, most countries have, have, have lost their, their big predators. I never dreamed that I'd ever photograph a wild tiger. And it was just beyond my wildest dreams as a young boy growing up in mm. Seattle. And here you grew up in Calcutta with a tiger cub in your house. Yes, my whole life has been about tigers. I think I've, I've become such a tiger activist. I worry about the cub's future. Where are they going to go? There isn't extra space now for, for all these cubs. It is such an important flagship species. By saving the key predator, you're saving everything else that's in its kingdom. And as soon as you lose an animal like that, then you also lose the reason for protecting these vitally important habitats. What I think that India must, must aim for is keeping our, uh, certainly our important protected areas intact, making them completely inviolate so that they're, they're untouchable for now and forever. Tigers are my obsession and my sort of reason for living. Until the day I die, I'll fight for the tiger.
The magnificent tiger has long been a symbol of wild India, but today it's more than that. It's a symbol of the natural world under pressure. I'm Art Wolf. Join me next time on Travels to the Edge. The Baja Peninsula can strike you as a barren, empty landscape. Just cactus, sand, and heat. But as your eye adjusts, the unexpected comes into focus. I'm Art Wolf. This is Travels to the Edge. Whenever I have a chance to get in a small plane and get above the land, I jump on that. It's such a great way to get a sense of the land, and it is also a great way of photographing the land. Bounded by the Sea of Cortez on the east and the Pacific Ocean on the west, the Baja Peninsula is a thousand miles of arid landscape. This is where the desert meets the sea. The waters of the sun-drenched Sea of Cortez, or Gulf of California, are a primary breeding and feeding habitat for many resident and migratory species. I'm exploring the region with my friend Patricio Robles Hill, one of Mexico's leading conservation photographers. We're starting our journey here on Santa Catalina Island. Patricia, this is beautiful. But what makes this place so unique? Just look at it. This is, for me, it's the ocean, and here, the, the Sonora Desert, is the combination of the two is what makes this environment, the Gulf of California, so special. Everybody hears about desert, and they think that it's only sand. This is really a very diverse environment. You see life everywhere. This place in the Gulf has over a hundred islands. Are they all like this? I mean, we're not seeing development here. Well, they are very pristine. They are, of course, reserves. The vegetation is what makes them special. Mexico is uh, one of those mega diversity countries. We have rainforests, we have pine oak forest, and we have deserts. But I think the Gulf of California and the islands by itself is what it makes very unique. There's nowhere else in the world that uh, there's a place like this. It's what you could say Mexico is different here. The most famous cactus on this island is the barrel cactus. It grows larger here than anywhere else in Mexico. What I'm doing with this is shooting with a wide angle, which allows me to incorporate the mountains in the distance and the beautiful waters beyond. I got this beautiful cardon cactus perched on the edge of a cliff. I love shooting multiple angles of a single subject like this. And since I've worked so hard to get up here, you can bet I'm not gonna leave with just one composition. These are the shots I love to find and bring back. The sun is almost setting beyond the distant mountains on the Baja Peninsula, and all these cactuses are really picking up that oblique angle of the sun, and they're so textured that they become three-dimensional. This is the magic hour. Just a little bit of the sun will eliminate the lens flare and allow me to get a good shot. Last seconds of the light, it really changes fast. 
when the sun is on the margin, and this is beautiful. After working all day long in the intense heat of the desert, I find it really satisfying to sit back in the cool breeze reviewing the work that I've shot all day. Look at this. Hundreds of dolphins are racing towards our boat. They're coming literally to meet the boat. Oh, I'm so excited. This is what it's all about. Come on, guys. Come and get your photos. They're everywhere. Dolphins everywhere. I love this. This is exciting. They understand there's a TV show being done, and they just obviously want to be stars of the show. Occasionally, one will just completely jump out of the water. Right when they come out of the water, you can see their eyes, their head. It's almost like it's all choreographed, like a water ballet right now. I could do this literally all day long. Laguna Ojo de Liebre, a rich and expansive wetland on the Pacific side of the peninsula, is a sanctuary for thousands of seabirds. This is beautiful. There's several thousand sandpipers just flying in unison. nice shot here with an osprey that's got a nest out in the open. As this adult is flying around, I'm just waiting for that one moment, like now. That's so dynamic when it spreads out its big long wings and just hovers in the air for a brief moment. sea lions and they're saying art, 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 art. These are fertile waters and it's here that we're hoping to find gray whales on the final leg of their epic migration. The longest of any mammal on the planet. They come all the way down the coast from Alaska and they come into these bays to give birth to mate, it is a huge nursery in these protected lagoons on the west coast of Baja. When gray whales are born, they're 15 feet long. They weigh up to 1,500 pounds, and they can swim virtually at birth. Nobody really understands completely why they choose these lagoons. Uh, a lot of speculation is that the salinity of the water is very high, and so the babies can bob easier upon birth. Now this is a pretty big whale here. It knows we're here, it can hear the engine, and it's up to the whale whether it comes to us or not. There's one coming right under our boat. Yeah, he's right there, look at that. Come up and look at us. And he did. Oh, this one's coming our way. 
That's a good sign. He's coming straight at us. There is a 30-ton animal heading our way. He's coming up. Oh, he's a baby. Oh. oh. Hey, this is a whale. <laughs> oh, yes. That was a close encounter. There's a lot of whales right here. We're literally surrounded now by gray whales. And it's amazing to me that at one point, early in the last century, they were hunted to near extinction. And now they've come back in great numbers and they're positively friendly. You know what, these whales, the whalers used to call them the devil fish. Why? because they hunt the babies just to attract the mother and the mother will come furiously and, and actually attack the boat at that time. And now I think it's very nice how with so many years of conservation and protection, now they are really, really friendly and they come and get so close they want to be touched. The only thing you cannot touch is the eye and the blowhole. Otherwise your, our germs could infect it. Yeah. Here. Oh, look at this one. There's a baby, it's right below us. <laughs> okay, this is cool. I like this. Oh, coming to the surface. Oh, I'm in the wrong place. Here. Oh. Here. Hey, oh, it's right there. He's rubbing. Look at that, I touched the whale. <laughs> The well. <laughs> that was one of the best encounters of my life. Woo! Yeah! We're heading inland now towards the isolated Sierra de San Francisco mountain range. It's a tough and sometimes bizarre landscape. As I'm traveling through these really remote San Francisco mountains, these really interesting trees caught my eye. These are known as cereal trees or bujum trees. They're really shaped by the relentless winds that often come in off the Pacific Ocean. As a result, they almost look like they were designed by Dr. Seuss. These shots are really trying to convey a sense of this place, this really rugged, wild mountain range here in the Baja, but in a fun way. The remote canyons of the Sierra San Francisco guard Baja's most important rock paintings. Sites are difficult to reach and guides are essential. Hola. 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 After saddling up, we begin the trek down into San Pablo Canyon and our quest to find these ancient cave paintings. It's amazing how sure-footed these mules are on this really steep, rocky terrain. This has been a long ride down this steep canyon. I'm one tired cowboy. I've spent most of the day on a mule. What I'm trying to do now is just take some wide angles to really convey a very different sense of place. 
As I walk along the creek in the bottom of this canyon, I'm just looking for a couple last minute shots. Maybe it's a reflection of the wall in the stream. It could be just details in this creek. I'm just on a mission, looking for that last great shot. As morning breaks, Patricio and I head off to find the cave paintings. On the way, I'm pleasantly surprised to come across Zantu's hummingbirds bathing in a canyon spring. I'm getting shots of the hovering Xanthus, but there's also another hummingbird, which I'm not really sure could be a Lucifer. And it's just coming in right now. They just look, they hover, and then they land and they take a bath. A little bit more in front of us are the cave paintings. On the walls ahead? Yes, yes. That is beautiful. This is one of the most impressive panels I've ever seen. The sheer size of this, the vibrance of the color, and the number of human figures, and they all kind of overlap. It's very exquisite. Let's go up and look closer. This is spectacular. How on earth did they ever paint way up there? This is like traveling back in time to ancient America. The power of the art, that's what connects me to this place. And knowing that a human, and we don't even know when, that human painted that red line or that foot or that animal, it instantly connects you to this place. You are an artist. You started as a painter, and also I, I did the same thing. The guys who painted it were artists, and they were the shamans, they were the druids in, in their times. In some way, Art, you and I, as a conservation photographers, I think we are the new shamans, because we photograph what is at risk, all the wildlife, the animals, the places that are really threatened, and we show to society this is what needs to be taken care of for our own survival. Further north is the Catavina Desert, one of my favorite places to isolate the essential elements of this landscape. I'm getting a really subtle image of the desert right now. A very, very quiet and yet emblematic shot of the desert right before dawn. And now I'm off and running, and I'm just trying to get a series of shots before the light actually hits. The sun will be here within a minute. Now I'm looking for a subject for that. Light's coming up here. Not it. This is really nice right up here. It's beautiful. Now 
I'm going to walk around this rock and try to play with the different angles and see how many abstract compositions I can get out of a single rock. In fact, right from here, this is rather interesting because I can see the top of a cardon cactus right through the hole in this rock. The Catavina is a great place to photograph, but rarely do I walk through an environment and immediately find an interesting shot. Often, I'm really scouting locations that I will later return to and frame when the light gets great. Anybody that knows me as a photographer really understands that I love to work with the elements of design. And in this simple shot, I've got patterns, line, and texture. Beautiful light, great depth, simple shot. This is really a lot of fun to play with wide angles and rounded rocks and curved Bujun trees. It's very, very different than photographing wildlife. You've got holes in rocks and twisted trees and wow, that's pretty interesting too. Wondering if I got in this rock and shot out what it would look like. I'm going in the rock. Goodbye. It's just a beautiful framing using this hollowed out granite rock as my frame. It's really cool. I like nothing more than putting my mind in a relaxed state and just simply responding to the textures and the changing light as the sun is moving across the sky, suddenly a simple rock becomes a sculptured element. There's something to be said about working with a minimalist landscape that you can come away with some of the most striking compositions. The more I am engaged and really work a subject, the more I discover. I'm really working hard for this Bujum tree because it's got such interesting angles. It's, it's like a ballet dancer with these graceful twists and curves. And the more I walk around it, the more it reveals itself. And as the light drops, everything becomes magical. In this spare environment, beauty reveals itself with each passing moment. And the more you look, the more you see. I'm Art Wolf. Join me next time on Travels to the Edge. A tiny Buddhist kingdom is taking the path of enlightenment into the 21st century. This is Bhutan, where preserving traditional culture and the environment is considered essential to its people's well-being. I'm Art Wolf, and this is Travels to the Edge. Hidden in the eastern Himalaya between India and China lies the tiny, sparsely populated mountain kingdom of Bhutan. Having thrived for centuries in isolation, Bhutan is committed to preserving its unique identity as it begins to make contact with the outside world. The Buddhist principles of peace, tolerance, and nonviolence are at the heart of these warm and welcoming people. Traveling with me is Bhutanese guide Pema Sonam. We are largely Buddhist and 
land of promise. People seem so friendly and content. Actually, we have that uh, interesting concept of gross national happiness. I've heard about this. What is that? <laughs> it's actually started by the fourth king, His Majesty. And his idea was uh, to, you know, see the happiness in the people. So that is guided by the four main pillars. These are the good governance, um, sustainable economic, preservation of uh, the culture, mm -hmm. and the protection of the environment. Basically, we are a Buddhist country, and the Buddhism teaches us not to be materialistic. Tattered prayer flags dance in the wind on hillsides and high mountains everywhere in Bhutan. Inscriptions of prayers written on these flags are designed so that as the wind ravages these flags over a period of time, the prayers are scattered to the heavens. It's very moving to see the monks consecrate these prayer flags and bless the messages that will be carried away by the wind. I'm framing a really interesting scene here. There's these beautiful offerings, including a peacock feather with these four monks chanting in the distance. And I'm just playing the foreground against this beautiful backdrop. So it's a really complex shot from a perspective of having really a three-dimensional effect. So that's what I'm trying to do here by getting in so close. It's such a beautiful religion with all the pageantry of these colored flags. Overlooking the large green expanse of the Pojika Valley is the monastic school of Gangte Gompa. Pema has made arrangements for me to observe the morning prayers. Each day, these young monks worship and study together. A monk enters the monastery as a young boy, and his spiritual training continues throughout his life. It's an austere life, but with hardship and devotion comes enlightenment. On the road in Bhutan, there's a lot of distance in between destinations. So I really take advantage of the time by working on my images on the laptop, charging my batteries. I've got an inverter that's plugged into the car battery, and I'm good to go for a long way. Situated between two rivers, the Fo Chu, male river, and the Mo Chu, female river, the Punaka Zong is arguably the most beautiful in all of Bhutan. This zong is spectacular. Tell me a little bit about the zongs. The zongs were built during the 17th century by Shabdung, the one who unified the country. The reason for uh, making the zong at that time, 
it's only for the defensive purpose. So now we don't use for that purpose. So it's half used as the administrative office of the district and half for the monastic body. These are the places I mean, where the monks, they live and then they do their studies. When we talk about the monk's life, you must be wondering why these little kids are here in a monastery and then who decides. Yeah. It's actually the parents that who decides uh, where to send their the parents. boy. Yeah. In olden times when we don't have the Western education here, it was compulsory that one son from the family has to go to the Buddhist study in the monastery. Now it's not compulsory. In the Buddhist country, they become a monk for a time being, like six months or about a year. But here in Bhutan, when you become a monk, it's for the lifetime. This is a really nice tradition. An old man is spinning a giant prayer wheel, and within this giant prayer wheel are literally thousands of prayers. As he spins it, he's gaining merit or credit for having done so. Nice. Uh, you know what I like about this? Is so much wildlife is incorporated into the design. Especially we have these mythical animals. When you see a zong, it's so impressive from a distance. But when you start to get inside this and discover the ornate detail, virtually every square inch of this building is covered with beautiful designs. Riding through a forest in the mountains of Bhutan. Very nice. The black-necked crane is revered as a heavenly bird and a harbinger of good luck in Bhutan. Pema and I are headed off to a prayer flight site to get a good view of these endangered birds. This is beautiful up here. And this is all protected. Yeah, protected area. I don't see any power lines here. Actually, we don't have the electricity. The reason is that it's for the birds. Because of the birds, there's yeah. no power lines. No power lines. Instead, like, we use the generator and the solar energy here. They nest in Tibet during the summer months, and then they come over here and winter over. They come here during the mid of October, and then like by mid of March, they fly back again to Tibet. This is a mm -hmm. great view. We're surrounded by prayer flags. We're in a high mountain valley in Bhutan, and below us is an endangered black-necked crane. Oh, look at them playing. Oh, see? Oh, look at the two coming in here. Oh, I love the way the wind blows these flags, too. They do everything as a pair. They're obviously really imprinting on each other right now before nesting season. What flyers. We've got good karma. Good karma because we burn incense in the morning to please the deities. This is surreal to be surrounded by prayer flags while these highly endangered birds are dropping out of the heavens and landing right in front of me. I couldn't have choreographed this any better. This is our national sport, the archery. Archery is your national yeah. sport. Here they are playing with the traditional bow and arrow that's uh, made from the bamboo. I would like to introduce you to the traditional sharpshooters. Okay, I'd love to okay. meet these guys. Hello. 
Hello. Art. Art. It's very nice meeting you. How far is that target? That's wow. About, oh, that's about 140 meters. 140 meters, the size of an American football field. This is amazing. Can I take pictures here? Oh, yes, yes, please. So what they're uh, trying to do here is that, you know, when the other, uh, other team is shooting, you know, so they try to distract him so that, you know, ah. he don't hit the target and then, like, the opening gets the point. So can I distract one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. They still come very close. But don't touch me. What? <laughs> Wow! Oh! Nearly. He came that, that close that to the target. Kid. Teach me. How am I holding the arrow? Like this? I know. Don't worry, I'm not going to kill my cameraman. Run for your lives! Oh, they are. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. These forests with the swirling mist, they're really enchanting to me. Thanks to Bhutan's progressive environmental policies, over 60% of the land has been set aside to preserve the native forests. The success of this plan is obvious to me as I travel through the countryside. The beauty of the landscape is exquisite. Buddhist religious festivals called seishus are an important part of Bhutanese culture. The dances performed by monks reenact the life of Buddha and the history of Bhutan. This is the beginning of the Paro Dance Festival and it begins in small monasteries up on the hillside above Paro, and tomorrow it will go down to the main zong in Paro. All these are dancers that are streaming up this mountainside. This is what it's all about, to be amongst this culture here, high in the Himalayas, to see them practicing traditions that are hundreds and hundreds of years old and it's not being performed for tourists, it is for them. Thank 
The way these dancers are just beautifully spinning with their long, ornate robes is such a great moment. The day after the festivities at Zong Draka, Pema and I head to the magnificent Zong in Paro for a celebration on a much grander scale. This Paro Zong is my favorite. It's so ancient looking. The Sessu is in fact a religious ceremony, isn't it? Yes, sir. It's dedicated to the one that who introduced the Buddhism here in the country. We call it Second Buddha or Guru Rinpoche. And when did he bring Buddhism into Bhutan? It was during the 8th century on the invitation of the king of Bumtang. And that's how we believe the Buddhism was brought into our country. This is a pretty important and reverent ceremony. Uh, yes, like uh, by watching, you learn about the teachings of Buddha. These movements are so graceful and hundreds of years old, and they all tell a beautiful story. This is known as the skull dance, and these dancers are protectors of the religion. These are the black hat dancers. There's 21 of them. And they're performing a purification rite, driving out the evil spirits and taking over the sacred ground here. This dance ritual has been performed in the square for hundreds of years. And as I photograph this, it feels like I'm moving back in time. It's a very solemn dance very rich in detail, pattern, and grace. Looking down on all these dancers as they're spinning, I'm taking really some nice abstract shots. I love this perspective. Looking down and as the black hat dancers spin, I'm taking a very long exposure and so it's just a spiral. Very artistic, very abstract, just a different view of this dance. There's this disreverence that you feel as you watch this. This is a very powerful and ancient tradition here. It's a long ways up there. Yep. Hema and I are making the long hike up to get the most iconic view in all of Bhutan. The Taksang Monastery, also known as the Tiger's Nest. This is a steep hike, Hema. Yeah, it's worth it. We are going to visit one of the most sacred places here in Bhutan. This is it. Yep, the tiger's nest. It goes back to the 8th century. It's believed like the second Buddha or the Guru Rinpoche rode on the back of a tigress and then like uh, flew and landed somewhere in the cliff, which is inside the temple, uh -huh. where we have the cave and did the meditation to bring down the local deity. Later, in 1695, one of the spiritual master, you know, did the construction of that temple uh, in the memory of Shabdung Naung Namgil, one who unified the country. So why is it important for the Bhutanese to visit this site? By offering the prayers and then like with the, sort of offerings here, they get, you know, better life, they gain karma.
this is the classic view of Bhutan, the Taksang Monastery perched on this very steep granite hill. But what makes it so great is the way the light is illuminating these prayer flags. The wind is sweeping up the slope and the prayer flags are right perpendicular to where I'm standing. It is such a classic view. There's no other place like this in the world. Bhutan has survived in isolation for more than a thousand years. As this enlightened nation greets the 21st century, its greatest challenge is preserving its soul. The signs seem promising. I'm Art Wolf. Join me next time on Travels to the Edge.